You're listening to the Whole Hog Football Podcast, sponsored by Landers Toyota of Northwest Arkansas. Every Monday through Friday during the Razorbacks football training camp, bringing you the latest news, position analysis, and more. Here's your hosts, Matt Jones and Scotty Bordelon. It's finally here. It's game week. Arkansas will play Cincinnati on Saturday at 2.30. The game will be on ESPN. SEC Network is in town as well. They're going to have their pregame show in Fayetteville this week. You already kind of feel a little bit of a buzz in the air, and certainly that'll build as we get closer to kickoff Saturday at 2.30. Matt Jones with Scotty Bordelon of Whole Hog Sports and Tom Murphy of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. And yeah, I don't know about you guys, but it, it finally feels good that we're able to talk about another team and a game as opposed to talking all about camp. You just kind of run out of things to talk about camp-wise Uh, But today we can talk about Arkansas-Cincinnati, and that's one of the big games of the weekend, the only top 25 matchup of the uh, week that's going to be on an SEC campus. Oh, yeah, that's right. And honestly, the last week or two, um, coming up with storylines has been a little bit more difficult. You can tell the team has, you know, kind of hit that phase where, you know, they're just ready to play a game. And I guess this happens every year, but it's always an awkward kind of week. And uh, it's a great – weekend for college football um and the Razorbacks haven't had a game of this magnitude on campus basically in forever because it'll be the first time they've played a, a ranked team while they were ranked in their season opener yeah it's pretty cool for me I think it's what first time since 1980 I mean I was not even born yet um just so yeah it's gonna be a pretty unique deal and I think it's it's really cool to start the season with a game kind of of this magnitude where, you know, you're not playing it kind of like Rice last year, I think, where, you know, you're opening the season. Obviously, there's lots of excitement around season openers, but everybody's looking forward to the next week. Um, I'm just, yeah, pretty pumped that um, kind of all eyes are, are, are on on this game. And that game in 1980 was played in Austin against Texas. There's never been a game to start a season between two top 25 teams in Fayetteville, so that really makes this game unique, Tom. Uh, it does. I did a little research on that, as I think you have as well. Uh, Arkansas is winless in games in which they were ranked and the um, season opening opponent was ranked. It goes back to 1961, a loss at Ole Miss, and then losses to Stanford in 1970, I believe, and USC in 72, and then the Texas game in 80. So it's a very – it's basically a handful of games, none on campus, and – um. Arkansas hasn't won one, so uh, a lot of history could be made on Saturday. That 61 game against Ole Miss was played in Jackson. The games in 70 against Stanford and 72 against Southern Cal were played at War Memorial Stadium in Little Rock. Sam Pittman had his radio show on Wednesday night. You know, as always, there's there's a lot of fun things that you can take out of his radio show, a lot of really insightful things. Uh, but, Tom, I think the, the thing that stood out to me the most last night was the line where he was talking about fake injuries. And he said, you know, you can go back and, and review those now. And he said it, he doesn't think that any of the, the teams will get caught in the act, but that you're going to have some video reviews and you might see some coaches – get dinged financially because of it. And then he said, they ain't getting me, by the way, because we don't do that. (laughs) He's a funny guy when it comes to those kinds of things. And, yeah, there's been – since he's been head coach, yeah, there's been a couple of games. I know Ole Miss uh, felt like there was some of that going on and maybe even last year in the road game at Ole Miss. And I'm having trouble remembering if there were any others. Missouri. Oh, gosh, yes, Missouri. And you – you, you'd like to say that the punishment ought to be if a guy goes down like that, that he doesn't come back in during that series. And um, I don't know what the ultimate, you know, ruling will wind up being, but they've got to do something. It's got to be more than just, well, you contact the the conference office. So uh, we'll, we'll see what comes of that. But uh, Sam's funny when he talks about those kind of things, Scotty. Yeah, he really is. I, I remember after the, I think it was the Monday after, um, that Ole Miss game last year, and I think maybe it was you or or Bob that that asked Sam about the the fake injuries, and you know if if that's something that he sends into the office, and um, yeah, I mean you can touch on certain subjects with Sam, and he will talk for minutes and minutes on end. Um, you can just kind of really touch on on something that um, you know really hits home with him, and I think that that's one of them because he, 
you know, obviously places a premium on toughness, not only physically, but mentally. And um, I think that I think he kind of sees that in other teams as a sign of of weakness, um, honestly. And, you know, I think he he obviously wants that out of the game because, you know, everybody in the stadium came to to watch guys on the field, not lay on the field. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's definitely a, a, you know, a big talking point for him. I know that um, I think in the offseason. Um, he was one of the guys that, you know, probably was, you know, making a charge to to try to get this addressed. Well, he's on that board of governors, I think it is, for the American Football Coaches Association. You know, certainly wields some strong power in terms of their recommendations that go to the NCAA and uh, the the Football Rules Committee. Uh, and I think Hunter Juracek even has a seat now in that Football Rules Committee or or, or one of the maybe lower subcommittees that – that trickles up to that. So, you know, there is quite a bit of influence from Arkansas in that regard. I feel like they're going to have to really make the financial penalties uh, really hurt a head coach in order for that to get curtailed. Because, you know, when you've got every SEC West coach making $5 million plus dollars a year, you find them $10,000, $20,000. That, that's not, that's not really going to hurt them. I feel like it has to be something that, that really gets their attention in order for this to stop or, you know, they'll just pay the fine and they'll move on. Well, you make a point and, but here's the thing. Who's the ultimate judge on, you know, was the guy really hurt or not? Um, and I, I guess there would have to be compelling video evidence that, you know, it looks like the guy looks at the sideline and then just kind of lays down and then he goes over there and the, the trainers are looking at him, but there's really not too that much to it. And so I don't know how much subterfuge teams will devote to whether or not a guy's got a cramp or, you know, something more than that. But it's it's a it's a slippery slope. And, yeah, I would like to see it go away because um, um, it's it's really not a, a functional part of the game. Some of the other notable rule changes this year, by the way, to watch on Saturday, uh, there's now an appeals process on targeting in the second half. So basically, if a player is thrown out in the second half of a game, you can appeal that to where they could potentially have their suspension overturned for the following game. I remember the the Jalen Catalan play was one that uh, comes to mind against LSU in 2020, where he was thrown out late during that game and had to miss the first half next week against, was it? Missouri. Maybe- Missouri, yeah, that's right. Too. Yeah, and Hayden Hayden Henry had that happen to him. I think the last game in 2020, he missed the first half of the season opener last year because of yeah, that. that's right, that's right. Yeah, it was it was Missouri that that Catalan had to miss the first half of that game. Of course, uh, Arkansas lost a, a close game that day. Some other rule changes for 2022. Uh, they've basically outlawed blocking below the waist uh, outside of the tackle box. Sam Pittman talked about this last night on his co- on his uh, radio show and said, we don't teach that anyway, and, and he's happy to see that that's been taken out. The Kenny Pickett play, simulating a, a feet-first slide, that's going to result in a play being blown dead. Of course, uh, that was a big play in the ACC championship game last year. And then uh, a notable change, all defensive holding penalties will be an automatic 10-yard penalty and a first down. Let's talk about Cincinnati. The game is expected to be a physical game. You've got Sam Pittman, an old defensive lineman in college. Of course, he cut his teeth and and made his name as an offensive line coach. You've got Luke Fickle, who was a defensive lineman at Ohio State. When he played there, he set the school record for the most consecutive starts, uh, played defensive tackle, uh, coached a lot of great linebackers at Ohio State through the years. And so these are two coaches who have really made their identity and, and their reputation with physical strong football play and it's no coincidence i think that their teams kind of take on that identity uh it it feels like the team that wins at the line of scrimmage and you probably say this about every game but it feels like the line of scrimmage is going to be something really to watch on saturday as as a key to this game yeah i think it's it's been it was interesting i think a couple times on wednesday when we talked to sam both on the teleconference and then on zoom uh, that afternoon he said that you know if he was Cincinnati, he would just turn turn around if he was a quarterback and just hand the ball off to running backs and see, you know, kind of what Arkansas's defensive line is made of. Um, I just I think whichever line unit takes the field first for Arkansas, they've got to do a pretty good job of setting the tone. And I'm not concerned whatsoever really with the with Arkansas's offensive line. I think there's enough continuity there and those guys have, you know, a lot of synergy uh, playing with each other. Um 
but I think the defensive line is where maybe I have a little bit of pause going into this game. Like you feel really good about the front four, you know, if Arkansas does go with, with four down with the, with the two ends, Deshaun Stewart and, and Zach Williams, they seem like they've had pretty good preseasons and Springs. And so you feel good about them at end. And then your, your top two tackles, you know, Eric Gregory and Isaiah Nichols. Um, but where does the, like, who, who are you going to get quality snaps from, um, you know, maybe in those second units, is you know, in the past, I think Arkansas and Sam kind of referenced this too that you know with the whoever they send out on the defensive line, you know they normally run them in for four plays, off four plays, back in for four plays, something along those lines. So you're gonna be you're gonna have to count on, you know, those second string guys like Terry Hampton. I think he's gonna have to you know live up to the the price that he got in the preseason pretty quick, and you know maybe some guys that I'm kind of eager to see. Um, maybe just because we haven't seen a, a whole lot of them is Landon Jackson. I think he was running with the second team in an end spot. Um, I think he's going to be pretty important. But, you know, I think Tom asked Sam about pass rush yesterday, and he said, you know, the first thing you think about with a pass rush is, you know, a, a, an end beating a tackle, but it, there's a lot more to it than that. And Sam feels pretty confident with Gregory and Nichols being able to get push in the middle and then push in the pocket toward the ends. Um, I think that's where Arkansas might be able to have a little bit of success. Um, but I'm not, you know, obviously I'm not discounting what Zach Williams and Deshaun Stewart can do. Those guys are those guys are are pretty impressive guys. Well, when I look at this team, I, I think of the def- defensive front as being the the biggest question mark, the biggest um maybe lack of depth area on the team. And there's a bit of a no name quality, in my view, about these guys. I mean, because We've known of Zach Williams and Jashad Stewart for several years now. Um, and and Zach had a, maybe a sack and a half last year, but these guys haven't put up big sack numbers. And and um, how will they hold up against the run? I mean, they're not the biggest guys. And so um, I think teams like Georgia, they play big ball, big boy ball on Arkansas. They fit. They blocked the front well. They got to the linebackers, and they just they didn't have to pass. I don't think they threw eleven passes in that game, and they made them pay for running that three man front. Um, can Cincinnati? Does Cincinnati have the personnel to do that? I'm not sure they do, uh, but you know that's going to be a, a component of what their game plan is. If we can lean on them, if we can just keep moving the chains, we'll keep doing that. And so guys like Hampton are. Um, and, and, and the D tackles you reference are going to have to show up and defeat blocks and hold their gaps and do all those things that allow the linebackers to, to go to work, making tackles behind them. I think Eric Gregory is such a key, key factor on this team, how well he does on the inside. Um, you know, can, can he, uh, can he defeat man blocking? Do they have to devote two guys to him? All those things are huge. Um, Isaiah Nichols, what an unsung role he's going to have to play and mainly the nose. So um, I just feel like as the year goes on, those D, D tackles are, are going to be challenged for their depth. Arkansas can hardly afford an injury at that spot because you're talking about Cam Ball, Terry Hampton, and Marcus Miller uh, behind uh, the, the starting group. Yeah, I'm I'm really eager to see you know what kind of a look Arkansas gives Cincinnati defensively early. You know, whether they go, you know, first series, they might roll four D linemen out there. The next series, they might roll three. I'm curious if they, you know, with place an emphasis on potentially stopping the run first and maybe get a little bit more girth on the defensive line by going with three, getting three linebackers on the field, um, you know, three guys that, you know, you feel pretty confident that can, um, you know, shed blocks. Um, you know, fit through holes pretty well and, um, you know, get to the ball carrier. I think that's a that's a really interesting look. We've seen it a couple times in the preseason with Bumper, uh, Drew Sanders, and I think it was Chris Paul and uh, Jackson Woodard. Uh, those two guys have, have been running with Bumper and Drew a, a, a little bit uh, from what we've seen. So that three three five look is kind of interesting to me. That also gives you, you know, another defensive back that um, to put on the field that, that can be pretty physical in the run game. Scotty and I combined to write the 10 keys to or the top 10 keys for the Arkansas Cincinnati game. You can find that on our website right now at wholehogsports.com. But really two of them that, that stand out to me and that I thought were important to you know put high up in that story. Number one is playing sound on special teams. And number two is penalties. And I feel like early in the season, a lot of these, you know, week one, maybe even week two games 
are determined by big plays in the special teams or by a team committing too many penalties. I mean, Arkansas was able to overcome a, a really poor penalty day last year against Rice and ended up winning that season opener by three touchdowns. But it was a it, it was a very uncomfortable game up until the fourth quarter because again they they committed thirteen penalties, which was a season high or it, it tied for a season high, one of their highest penalty totals I think since the Petrino era. And then you know from a the special team standpoint against Georgia in week one in 2020, they had a punt blocked that really helped turn that game. It had been a tight game up until that point, about midway through the third quarter. And last year against Rice, they blocked a punt and set up a field goal for the Owls early in the second quarter of that game. And so the special teams we've seen, and, and we heard Pittman talk about this week, it's something that, you know, they're very aware that they've had some problems, especially in their punt protection early in the season. Uh, you know, that's something that I think they're watching closely. And then penalties, I think, is a really interesting key to this game because Arkansas and Cincinnati were two of the 13 most penalized teams in the country last year. Cincinnati was penalized 102 times. Arkansas was penalized 104. Yeah, Matt, good points all. And I, I got to tell you, you think back to mentally what you were thinking and feeling in that season opener against Rice last year. And it was this. It was it was be uncomfortable. K.J. wasn't on on point. He was uh he was too hyped up, wasn't delivering pat. I think they were mostly high, but he was just um erratic. And Traylon Burks had hardly practiced during camp because he had the foot thing, and he shows up and it was like looked sluggish. Uh they tried to get him the ball several times, like a run play, and Rice was ready for it, and they were tackling him for loss. And they, you know, they were off. And uh that's one of the that's one of the facets of this game that Arkansas is trying to, you know, just kind of kickstart faster. And you, you brought up the block punts. So they had block punts in the opener in 2020 against Georgia. That was a huge play, as you mentioned, the opener against Rice last year, but also they had a block punt in the road game at Auburn in 2020 that, you know, without that Arkansas probably wins the game. And it was just a random stray hand that got in when George Carrington was still the punter. And I think if he had had good peripheral vision, might have seen it come and he could have avoided that. But it, it wound up being a touchdown. It was a huge play. And then last year in game number four, I believe, or, or game five at Georgia, they had another punt block for a touchdown. So the way Sam put, Pittman put it was, they're going to be coming after our punts all day because of they, they've shown this. So it, as much as I like Max Fletcher as a guy and wrote about him today in the paper, he and his brother Mason, the punter for Cincinnati, as much as I like him and think he's going to be a great punter, I think they might go safe early on and uh, go with Reed Bauer. But I, I also think Max Fletcher will get a punt in this game. So I say all of that to uh, re reiterate and reinforce what you pointed out, Matt, that special teams, big plays uh, in a season opener are, are always uh, a thing. You know, one thing that, that Sam talked about, I think it was on Monday, um, was that, you know, Arkansas has just got to be super sound in their, their technique and in their, you know, their kind of their base coverage. I think Luke Fickle said it earlier this week, too, that something that's really hard to prepare for is like an environment because you, you can't prepare yourself to feel the types of emotions that you're going to feel on game day when you're just in a practice setting, right? And so... You know, he Sam knows that Cincinnati is going to throw different things at them. He says that, you know, they're not, you know, ready for at this moment. I think, you know, sometimes the the rushes on special teams, whether it's, um, you know, especially in, in punt coverage, like if, if Arkansas is going to let a Cincinnati player run loose, he's got to be coming, I think what Sam said, from Timbuktu. And he's just, you know, they, they just got to be really sound and – I think the shield, um, they've got a pretty good guy in that shield, Isaiah Nichols. He's really, really physical, obviously, middle of your, your defensive line. So I think you're you're okay there. But I think Arkansas has got to be on its on its toes anytime that, you know, they're in a punting situation backed up uh, near their end zone because I think that's when obviously most of the most of the block punts that have happened in the Scott Fountain era have taken place. So um and some of that too is like it, it kind of goes on the offense too. For for not being able to move the ball right, but um, that's you know part of being a complete team. You got to, you know, when one phase isn't quite getting it done, the special teams has to uh, has to pick up the slack and just make sure that that the game goes on, um, you know, as usual. 
I asked Sam Pittman this week, why do you see so many special teams mistakes in week one? And he said, a lot of times it's because you don't really know what the other team is going to throw at you on special teams. Cause you just haven't seen it on film. He said, it's going to be really imperative that Arkansas has good communication pre-snap. He said that communication might've avoided some of those block punts a year ago. I did look up this week, Cincinnati last season, there was a kind of an interesting, you know, they've got, ratings for everything now i found one called the Fremo efficiency index ratings which combines kickoff return kickoff punt return punt and field goal efficiency and even though cincinnati struggled field goal kicking a year ago they still ranked 18th nationally in this efficiency index rating for special teams a big reason why they blocked three punts and they blocked six field goals. Pittman says that one of the things that you see on special teams is that the teams that have recruited the better athletes are often you know, some of the better teams uh, in that area. And he thinks that because Arkansas has recruited better, that they're going to be better in special teams this year. Of course, Cincinnati uh, probably doesn't recruit up to the level of, of some of the SEC teams, but it recruits so much better than the other teams in the American. I think that's one of the reasons that you see their special teams uh, with the type of numbers that they have. The Whole Hog Football Podcast is brought to you by Landers Toyota of Northwest Arkansas, where you always get the best service and the best buying experience in the state. For all your automotive needs, shop Landers Toyota NWA in Rogers, where we guarantee you the best buying experience and best service after the sale in Arkansas. Landers Toyota NWA in Rogers. WholeHogSports.com has the largest, most experienced staff of reporters covering sports in Arkansas. Football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. You'll find it at WholeHogSports.com. The website includes up-to-minute news, daily commentaries, and award-winning photography from the staffs of Hogs Illustrated and the Democrat Gazette. For subscriptions, call 1-800-757-6277. That's 1-800-757-6277. Or visit us online today. WholeHogSports.com. Want more coverage of your home team? Download the Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Check out the Fan Zone and get up-to-the-minute videos, podcasts, and features on football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. Search for Whole Hog Sports on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire at home. And take it with you on the go by downloading it for your mobile device in your app store. The Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Get it today. Welcome back to the Whole Hawk Football Podcast. I want to remind you that on September 7th, Hunter Juracek will speak at the Hogs Illustrated Sports Club in Fayetteville. That'll be at the Hilton Garden Inn just off of Weddington Drive. For more information on his appearance, you can go to nwadealpiggy.com. That's one of our sister websites, nwadealpiggy.com. Hunter Juracek at the Hogs Illustrated Sports Club on Wednesday, September 7th. Back to the Arkansas-Cincinnati game this weekend. You know, the quarterback is, is certainly something that there's a lot of focus on this week. We don't know what Cincinnati's going to do. Chances are they're probably going to play Ben Bryant, who came down from Eastern Michigan, had previously been in Cincinnati's program. But there's a lot of, uh, you know, in, in terms of just continuity, there's not continuity there at Cincinnati. And there is with Arkansas and K.J. Jefferson in, in big games. The team that's got the better quarterback or at least the most experienced quarterback or feels best about their quarterback, that's certainly one that I feel like you have to favor, Tom. Um, I do think that's to Arkansas's advantage. Um, it seems to me like K.J. Jefferson is a very serious guy about improving his game. And so when we talked to Kendall Bryles in the spring, it was about making those reads faster, making his decisions faster, and getting the ball out into the tight windows to his receivers. So it's all about the mesh with the back, what KJ is reading and seeing, and then reacting to that. Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of the uh, the practice periods with team and how much the ball's been on the ground and how many picks he's thrown or anything like that. But I thought we got a real glimpse into his character when um, in this camp he talked about his his interceptions last year and that after the one against Ole Miss at halftime, he told the guys, hey, look, I'm not throwing any more interceptions the rest of the year. And as it turned out, he did not throw any for the final six games, but he did throw one in the um, Outback Bowl, and it was a streak of 171 consecutive passes. So if his ball security is on point, if he runs the ball with the authority, um, avoids huge hits, 
Um, KJ Jefferson should be one of the best dual threat quarterbacks in the country this year. Now, Ben Bryant, they say he's a willing runner, but when you look at his stats, it was mostly passing last year. I think his rushing was about break even, you know, when you count sacks into it. So Evan Prater is clearly the running quarterback for Cincinnati. I don't know if they're going to go with two guys. I get the sense that Bryant will start. Um, maybe if they struggle, we'll see if, if they can unleash Prater. But I do believe at home, uh, a big-time uh, rowdy atmosphere when Cincinnati has the ball, yes, I give the edge to the Arkansas quarterback situation. If I'm K.J. Jefferson, I'm probably pretty excited to face a defense that doesn't exactly know what kind of play is coming, right? Like, I feel like that's kind of what he's faced, you know, throughout the spring in this preseason. Um, you just always wonder nowadays because quarterbacks don't get touched. Like, they, I would be surprised if K.J. really got touched this preseason. Um, just He is total, totally off limits. I mean, obviously, all pretty much all quarterbacks are these days, but how is he going to respond to that first hit? As Cincinnati is obviously they they know what kind of a player he is and they want to get um, him in as many situations as possible where he's under duress and so I wouldn't be surprised if they throw some pressure at him early, uh, maybe try to rattle him early. I, I know that's what Arkansas is trying to do and you know Sam said earlier in the week that you know if, if Cincinnati plays its young quarterback and the crowd's loud, it could probably throw him off his game a little bit. But I think that KJ, based on what we saw last year, I mean he delivered big time and some really, really big games and some big moments um, and gave, you know, Arkansas fans, you know, a, a little bit of relief because they didn't know exactly what they were getting walking into the season. I think accuracy was a concern. And um, I think Sam said that last year, you know, they kind of figured out in the first game when KJ took off running down the sideline on one play that they, they finally realized what they had. And I think he's grown a lot since that point. And I think his down the field passing, is is going to be really key too because it's, this in a in a game like this where the emotions are so high and I think they're I think you're going to see a lot of momentum type plays in this game you know if he can connect on a deep ball or two early and kind of send a message to to Cincinnati that you know he's you know he's prepped and ready to go you know I think that can swing momentum too obviously it helps out the running game take a safety um, out of the box you know, just to um, be ready for what's coming over the top. But he hit 50% of his passes that traveled more than 20 plus yards last year. Um, I think on like 44 attempts, and he threw seven touchdowns, just one pick. I think it was the one Tom was talking about against Ole Miss. But um, I, I think I want to see him above all else just be sharper a little bit more than he was last year, kind of on those intermediate throws. I think if he does that, I think he can really take his game to another level. Um, obviously a really terrific runner, got really good vision and feel in the open field. And I got an email this morning with the um, with some of the, the top Heisman odds for for various players around the country. And KJ's got the 19th best odds right now. And so he's obviously very on the, I wouldn't say very on the outside, but he is on the outside of the Heisman conversation. Um, so there are some expectations on him this year. And um, like I said, based on, on what we saw last year, I think he'll live up to him. I listened to Luke Fickle's radio show the other night, and he said because Jefferson's being touted and kind of pushed for the Heisman Trophy this year, he wonders if he might not throw the ball more than he did a year ago, that that maybe he's a less willing runner. I don't know if that's the case. Uh, to Scotty's point, that run that really stood out to me in the season opener against Rice last year, I think it was like a 68-yard touchdown that was called back, at a penalty maybe on Keytron Jackson that they didn't agree with. They thought that it was a, a pretty clean block but it was called back, but that was really the run that maybe sit back in my chair and say, whoa, now I can kind of see it. It's not necessarily something that we had seen until that point. Right. And I think, I think the, I think to Luke Fickle's point, just about KJ throwing the ball more, I think that's kind of twofold, right? Like he's got guys in front of him on the offensive line that he's got a lot of confidence in. Like there are, there are at least two captain worthy guys on that, on that offensive line four returning starters. And Luke Jones, the guy that, you know, didn't stand out and camp for the wrong reasons. Like he's just kind of about his business and just does his job. But I think secondly, I think he'll be more willing to stand in the pocket and give his receivers a little bit more time to maybe de for plays to develop just because he's got more options this year. I think last year, if Traylon wasn't open right away, then, you know, his, his best option 
was probably to tuck the ball and, and see what he could do with his feet. But I think he's got four guys this year with Keytron, Jaden Hazelwood, Warren Thompson, and Matt Landers. Like he, he, I think there's a lot of belief in those guys built up uh, this preseason. And, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out myself which guy that I like the most, which guy I think is going to lead them in receiving uh, in terms of yards and receptions. I mean, there's, He's got his options there too, and I think that I think that gives him a lot more comfortability to just stand in the pocket and and, and survey and, and see plays develop. You mentioned those transfers, Hazelwood and Landers. Uh, you know, Arkansas's got a lot of transfers in who are expected to play. Drew Sanders, of course, at linebacker, has some some players, quite a few players, really on the second team defense who are going to rotate in. Uh, Terry Hampton, another one, is going to play quite a bit there in the middle of the defensive front. Cincinnati's got a lot of transfers in. They've, they've got a transfer, Ivan Pace, at linebacker, who came in from Miami of Ohio. Their kicker came in from Delaware. They've got a running back in from LSU. Uh, of course, Ben Bryant, we mentioned him, a transfer in from Eastern Michigan. Uh, I say all this to say I'm always interested to see how transfers are going to play in game one uh, because, you know, I've heard coaches talk about this quite a bit this week, is that there's really still an acclimation process that's happening with some of these transfers. and so even though you might think and they might have a good season, it may not show up in week one just because there's still a lot of learning going on. Prediction time now. We'll start with the college game day game this week. Ohio State is going to host Notre Dame. I mean, do you have any faith that Notre Dame can go into Columbus and win that? I do not. I don't think Notre Dame's going to have quite the manpower. Um, and it being a home game for Ohio State, yeah, I, I'm thinking that might be 10 or 12 point margin or more. It could be that I just don't have the greatest base of knowledge on Notre Dame, but I just I just don't trust Notre Dame in like these big, like these big time games. Um, so I, I go with Ohio State. Of course, Notre Dame's got their first year head coach Marcus Freeman, the former Ohio State player. I think that's that's really something to watch. Is is how did the team respond in his first game? I, I think that that Ohio State it could could really swarm Notre Dame this week. Another big game this weekend. There are three top 25 games. Notre Dame, Ohio State is one. Arkansas, Cincinnati is another one. And then the third is Georgia will play Oregon at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. The Bulldogs starting their defending or starting their defense of the national championship. I thought it was funny when some of the Georgia writers asked Sam Pittman about Dan Lanning, the new Oregon coach, um, also opening his career as Sam did against Georgia. And the first thing out of Sam Pittman's mouth was, yeah, well, that one was scheduled. He, he already knew that one was scheduled. We didn't. The SEC gifted Arkansas the Georgia game. And, you know, uh, we can go on and on about it, but uh, that was wrong what the SEC office did to Arkansas with uh, Georgia and Florida the year of the COVID. Um, I'm going to pick Georgia. I, I know that they've lost a lot of talent, but Stetson Bennett's back. I'm sure they're going to have a fine run game. I'm sure they got a lot of defensive – guys that are going to fill in for the the draftees they had and you got a new coach in, in Oregon um, so it's basically a home game for Georgia uh I got them winning pretty handily I'd say yeah I'm kind of in the same line of thought too like I don't expect Georgia's defense to necessarily be as good as last year but at the level that they recruit it wouldn't surprise me if they were you know in the ballpark it's you know as good of a defense as they had last year big deal having Stetson Bennett back it feels like he's been in school for a damn near a decade um so that that's a that's a, always a plus when you got a, a veteran quarterback who's got big game experience under his belt and then you know if you you follow uh pro football focus on Twitter I think they recently came out with their their list of the top receiver groups nationally I think Georgia was up there too I always really like watching Georgia's receivers go at it and they've always got really good running backs too good lines too so um yeah i think georgia might run away with it i think georgia big don't ever pick against the bulldogs in atlanta another intriguing game in the sec this weekend and by the way we're only talking about games that are being played saturday and later there are some games that are being played earlier in the week utah is ranked number seven in the preseason ap poll it's their highest ranking ever in the preseason they go to florida in billy napier's debut as the gators coach that game slipped by me, I guess, at SEC Media Days, and I thought I was paying attention to everybody's schedule as it rolled through. But uh, it's a fantastic cross-sectional game, a real challenge for, for Napier um, after the, the kind of um, uh, really disappointing end to the, to the Dan Mullen regime. I just think it's going to be a tough game for Utah to go in um, 
you know, the humidity level is going to be a lot different down in the swamp. I'm sure I, I was very impressed with Billy Napier at SEC Media Days. Certainly come up the Nick Saban tree and his well regarded in the industry. Uh, I'm I'm going to predict predict an upset there and, and say Florida beats the Utes. Yeah, I'll go the opposite direction. And Utah last year was, I don't know that I necessarily got to watch just a ton of college football games outside of the ones Arkansas was playing in, but I really did in the time that I got to watch Utah. I really enjoyed playing them. Obviously, it's a completely different team, but top 10 for a reason. And I think they're, they're one of those teams, you know, Sam mentioned this week that Cincinnati's defense will – you know, run and hit you in the mouth. I think Utah's kind of cut from that same cloth, too. Um, I don't necessarily know just a ton about their personnel, obviously. Um, just kind of had my head in the sand with, with Arkansas stuff this preseason, but uh, Utah's a team that I really enjoy playing, and I think they've, they've got some skill guys that, you know, I think they'll um, – It kind of if you're the, a casual fan, I think they'll, they'll really catch your eye and um, make, make watching them pretty enjoyable. I know Utah played Ohio State well in the Rose Bowl last year, and I think they've got quite a few players back, including their quarterback. I just think that even the middle and lower tier SEC teams are better than the top tier Pac-12 teams more often than not. And the fact they're playing Florida in the swamp, first game under a new head coach, I think that that's going to be a really tough game for Utah, and I like Florida. Uh, One more game, LSU against Florida State on Sunday night. This game's going to be played at the Superdome in New Orleans. Uh, Kind of surprising neither of these teams is in the top 25. I I don't think that either of the schools could have expected that when they scheduled that, but both of them have kind of fallen on hard times. Florida State's already won a game, by the way. They beat Duquesne 47-7 to last week. This will be LSU's opener under Brian Kelly. Guys, I struggled to uh, pick this game. And I eventually went with LSU, um, excuse me, I think I actually picked Florida State to win this game. A whole lot of turnover for LSU. Um, What's the quarterback situation going to look like? When people look at the question marks for LSU, it's the offensive line, and that's not a good place to have question marks going into a season. Um, I like, uh, I I, I hope that that, uh, Greg Brooks and Joe Fouché play well for the LSU secondary. Um, they have done very well in these games at, um, you know, in New Orleans. And uh, I think it's going to be a tight game. But uh, for some reason, I picked Florida State. Yeah, somewhat similarly to Georgia playing in Atlanta. I think for, for me, I don't. I just wouldn't pick it against LSU in, in New Orleans. I think LSU's fans are going to travel. I think they're really intrigued by a Brian Kelly game day and just what his decision making is going to be just what what his team looks like coming out of his first preseason um obviously there are a lot of question marks with with lsu but i'll take them since the since uh with the proximity i think that obviously is on their side yeah i'm with you about lsu in new orleans but i picked florida state for this simple reason actually two simple reasons florida state further along obviously under mike norvell than lsu is under Brian Kelly, but I think the fact that Florida State had a chance to knock off the rust last week is a really big deal, and the fact that this is going to be LSU's opener, I just tend to lean, when I think it's kind of a toss-up, I kind of lend, or I tend to lean toward that team that's got the experience already this year of playing in a game. I don't think there's any way to simulate that, so I picked Florida State, but I can certainly do that one either way. I will say on the flip side of that, that LSU does have some film of Florida State that Florida State doesn't have of LSU. I doubt Florida I think, State put too much out I'm there. Sure they did, I'm sure they. I'm sure they probably didn't, but they can. Pro- they can. You know, they can get some clips on guys that yeah. they know that they need to hone in on. Arkansas and Cincinnati. We mentioned that this is going to be the first top 25 matchup ever in Fayetteville to open a season. Uh, the Razorbacks are a slight favorite over the Bearcats, who played in the college football playoff a year ago, but they have to replace nine players who went to the NFL draft. I'm going to pick the Razorbacks there at home. I think on paper, I see Arkansas as being slightly more talented. It's it's the Cincinnati run game and whether or not Arkansas can t- contain that that's got my uh, intrigue up. But I think all things considered, um, the Razorbacks are going to find a way. You know, what Sam Pittman has done with his team is he's shown them how to be confident in winning games, and they believe in that now. And this is um, essentially a a toss-up. I believe that at home, the Razorbacks are going to find a way. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat, too. Um, I've been kind of going back and forth with, like, it makes a difference on on kind of a final score prediction. And I was, you know, bouncing between 28-21 Arkansas and 27-20. 
um, Arkansas. I just think it's going to be that kind of a game where um, there might be some points early just because, you know, the nerves are going to be going for, for both defenses, I think, early on, just trying to figure out what's coming at them. And I think you'll probably see the defenses settle in as the game goes on. Um, I think if the team can come up with a defensive score, that could potentially be a difference maker in the game, possibly a, a special team score. I know Arkansas hasn't returned to kickoff, I don't think, since Davion Warren did it, maybe in 2017. Um, and I know they're looking to get a little bit more fireworks out of the return game this year. Um, I just think defensively for Arkansas, Drew Sanders makes such is going to make a, a, a such a difference, and not have Bumper Pool running out there, you know, having to make 125 tackles just to make the the defense operate like it wants to. I think his playmaking ability is going to be pretty big, and um, I just yeah, I, I'm with Tom though. I think if Arkansas is not able to contain the run, it, it could be a long afternoon. I don't think any of the Cincinnati players have played in an atmosphere like they're going to face in Fayetteville on Saturday. And you can say they played at Notre Dame last year, and they did. But if you go back and watch that game, about a third of that stadium was Cincinnati. When you play at Notre Dame, it's kind of like when you play the Cowboys in Arlington. It's it's a destination for teams. And so you've got a lot of fans who want to go there and watch the games, and, and they'll pay top ticket, or you know they'll pay a top price for tickets. You saw that when Georgia played South Bend a few years ago too. You know, I, I think back to the Arkansas Texas game last year. There are only a handful of teams that I think would have beaten Arkansas that night in Fayetteville, and I think it's going to be that type of atmosphere on Saturday. Certainly not a night game. It's going to be a mid-afternoon game. But, you know, by all indications, this is almost a sellout. It might be a sellout by kickoff. I just think that this is going to be a really rowdy atmosphere. And when you have two teams that are pretty evenly matched, like it seems like Arkansas and Cincinnati might be, or at least they look like they are on paper, uh, I, I tend to go with the team, like I said earlier, that's got the experienced quarterback. Arkansas has that. And then the team that's playing at home, because I just don't know that Cincinnati uh, knows what they're walking into from a, an environment standpoint. I can't see nearly as many Cincinnati fans making the trip to Fayetteville as did to South Bend last year. And so I think Arkansas is going to end up winning this on Saturday. I think that Luke Vickle throughout the week, you know, he admitted, I think on at his Tuesday press conference that last year he didn't do a, a really good job getting his guys ready for the magnitude, the environment, the atmosphere of that college football playoff semifinal game against Alabama. I understand it was a neutral field, but that's a platform that those guys hadn't been on um, in their lives. And so, you know, it's obviously not apples to apples comparing that game to this Arkansas game, but I would imagine that Fickle this week was, you know, counting on the guys that were part of that game in late December to just kind of relay to the guys that haven't been in this kind of game, just kind of what they're stepping into. Because it's, I, I remember I've talked about, I, think, I know I've talked about this before, maybe on a radio show, but outsiders who come to Arkansas and they hear that first hog call, it can be, you know, it can probably be pretty alarming. Um, I would imagine just kind of wondering what in the world they just stepped into. Um, so I would imagine he's, he's called on his leaders to kind of get the, get the younger guys prepped for this. Fickle was an assistant coach at Ohio State in 2010. He said this week on his radio show, he said the hog call can really get stuck in your head. He said, hopefully we can do enough to minimize how many times we hear it in Fayetteville. Again, Arkansas and Cincinnati, 2.30 on Saturday on ESPN. Come to wholehogsports.com before, during, and after the game. We've got a ton of coverage, and we'll have a lot of coverage afterward. For Tom Murphy and Scotty Bordelon, I'm Matt Jones. We'll be back with the Whole Hog Football Podcast next week. Have a great weekend, everyone. The proceeding has been a production of wholehogsports.com. Look for our latest podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast store. And visit us anytime at wholehogsports.com for the latest news and commentary.